Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. This is Grant Cameron, and I'm uh, doing another episode today of UFOs and Artists. And uh, when we first proposed this, we had a lot of artists come to us. There is a bizarre connection between art and musicians and art and UFOs. And um, one of the people I forgot about was my guest today is Derek Chin, who's a good friend of mine from many, many years ago. Uh, we did a lot of discussion. When when did you leave Winnipeg, Derek? How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing really good, Grant. It's nice um, nice of you to have me on. Yeah. Uh, I, left, I left Winnipeg in uh, 2001. And, 20 years, yeah. Oh, 20 years. You and I met in uh, 1989. I saw you with a folder under your arm that said UFO on it. And wow. I asked if I could join you for a coffee. There you go. And the rest <laughs> is history. We've yeah, always we had, we had a lot of conversations about UFOs, and, and I really didn't know that much of your story. I sort of learned a little bit about it today. I always knew about your art, and uh, we're going to look a little bit through your art today, go through your story. And um, uh, I was always fascinated, and I've been, I appreciate you and your son allowing me to use your art. We've sort of put it in different, um, on my website at one time, I had some of your stuff on there, and uh, uh, some of the book covers. Uh, so I, I really appreciate the art that you guys have done, and I, I really feel bad that I, one of the people I forgot, I went, wow, my goodness, you, I've known you for years, and I knew you had all this art stuff. So let's go through this, and uh, I'm going to take over the screen, and yeah. what's going to happen is we're going to go to a PowerPoint that I've uh, put together here, which has some of your art, and then we're going to go to um, your... Um, Some of your art so this is um the beginning of the powerpoint presentation it's sort of like uh, you're going to be off camera but you're now on camera so uh this is uh your art now this one here you sent me today and we can maybe start with this that you and your son are sort of um busy and you're doing 3d printing and stuff now so talk about this uh being and the fact that you are now about to go into 3d printing on this Okay, well, we first got this picture from a newspaper clipping. Okay. And it was a picture of a blurred so-called alien that was only uh, 22 inches high, and it was vibrating so much, the photographer and the people that witnessed it could barely see it. Wow. Well, so I actually took this from a very, very blurred picture. Wow. And, uh, so your son, when did your son start painting? You used... You... Uh, we'll, we'll get to yours in a minute, but your son started very, very young, I think. He was doing some of that art that I had used very, very young, right? Yeah, my son started this when he was about 17, 18 years old. Okay. Uh, okay. It was in about 2004, 2005. He started, uh, he started collecting 3D uh, printing programs, computer programs, yeah. and he actually started producing these models. All these models, by the way, are printable. And one day we we want to print some of them out, not all of them, but we we're looking forward to printing some of them out. Yeah, and we'll we'll provide your details for your son's website and where you're doing it because what we're trying to do is we're trying to help artists because we're going to interview a lot of artists and doing UFO stuff and put a sort of a central thing where people can um, sell their art because there's a lot of people collect this kind of stuff. And well, they may not know about you. So we'll we'll get your, your details. And here's where I've used your background stuff in some of my presentations and stuff like that. Nicole, my assistant, is about is joining us now. And um, so this is the kind of stuff. And this is the one I've always I've loved. Uh, this is the one I want to put on a front cover. I'm doing a book called um, Alien Documents. And I, I've insisted to the guy who's doing the cover that I want this one on the cover just like that just uh with with the title on it and nothing more because what's going to happen is people will be walking down the aisle of the of the bookstore and see the the alien picture and go what is that and pick it up and then that's the way you catch their attention this is a, of all the art you guys have done this is the one that uh, i really like the most well i really i really like this one too and as i said i've done most a lot of the concept art for matthew but on this particular one he came up with that one all by himself wow yeah, that, that's fascinating. It's just uh, almost like it's like a real. It's just so amazing. Nicole, how are you doing? Are you here? I am here. I just didn't want to interrupt. There you go. I, this is this is my friend Derek. We've known each other, he says, since 1989. That's a long time. Derek, We've had nice a lot of UFO discussions. 
And today we're going to go through his art. I sent you some of the art and you went wowzer when you saw some of his art. I know. <laughs> like there was just, well, wowzers was because he sent me like 18 messages in a row too. That like never happens. There you go. But no, I was impressed. I was sad. I was looking at it on my phone and not here on my laptop, but yeah, I must we, have got the time confused. I thought we were starting at three. When well, we kept, move, we kept moving it, but there's another meeting in this room at uh, another hour from now. So we've got to be out of here. In an hour we may do a second session with derek because derek as you see has a lot of stuff and his son so here this is where the story starts so derek talk talk about this here and we'll go to the next slide in a second tell me how this all starts for you because you're you're an experiencer that's a part of the story i knew you had some interest i mean you don't have conversations like you and i had with ufos without being some sort of experience so talk about this uh 1969 episode Okay, well, this is, uh, this is my yearbook from uh, Philemon Wright High School in uh, Quebec. When I first moved to Canada, that's where I live. Uh, and you however, came from England? Uh, I, I come from Liverpool, England. Okay, good. Uh, okay. In that book is the second picture we're looking at right now, which I, had not, I hadn't seen this in about 40 years. And then I found some old friends, and one of my old friends still had a photograph of it. When I got it back, to my surprise, up in the top right-hand corner is a picture of two gray eyes with uh, long arms that you can barely make out what it is, but yeah. to me, it looks like a gray, and it was kind of shocking to see that because this was painted in 1969, and in the fall of 1966, the year I came to Canada, I had a UFO sighting, and it was, uh, it was on the Quebec side of the river. Uh, we were in the countryside, and we were up high behind uh, a monastery. And uh, you could, from where we were, you could see the Ottawa River and you could see the lights of Ottawa. And uh, you could see every star in the sky that night. Okay. And then all of a sudden, simultaneously, two friends are with me. This is strange the way it happened simultaneously. Simultaneously, we all said at the same time, like in a song, oh my God, look, there's a flying saucer. <laughs> and it was it was uh, it was a star that was brighter than all the other stars, and it was actually zigzagging quite fast, and it zigzagged about you know eight or nine times before it came to a stop. And when it came to a stop, it was right above us. So the next thing the next thing we know, uh, the, its light intensity diminished to the point where we couldn't see it anymore because you could see every bloody star in the sky. So then when we stopped looking up, we all simultaneously looked forward. Now we were on a little hillside and at the bottom of that hillside was a gravel road and then a farm fence and then a field full of corn and then the monastery. And there was a tree there at the bottom of the hill. So when we all simultaneously looked forward, there was a cigar shaped cloud hanging right beside the tree. Well, to my amazement, uh, the two fellows I was with that were older than me, I must have been only 14 years old or something, before I knew it, they were already down at the bottom of the hill, screaming in terror, and they were already going over the fence by the time I could even react. <laughs> so I ran down, of course, I ran down too. They ran under that cloud, and I ran under it, and I never did find them, and I never saw them for a few days. Wow. And apparently they went to Carleton University in Ottawa and went and talked to an astronomer. And the astronomer told them that it was just some kind of light phenomena to do with the Ottawa River, uh, the movements of the water and reflections of the stars. Of course. However, it wasn't I've been that. told that before. <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely wasn't that. It was a zigzagging, very bright star. And uh, the amazing thing is, is that it stopped directly above us. And, uh, and then we saw it see the cloud and boom. Did you, did you know, like at that time, people didn't know about abductions and missing time and stuff. Did you know something had happened or was it just still just a sighting? No, to me, it was just a sighting. There was nothing, no more thought put to it than, oh, it's a flying saucer. I don't think even the term UFO was being in, uh, had been in use yet. Yeah. And we certainly had never seen greys, you know, people, even in UFO books, they only spoke of, of just sightings. Yeah. They never really spoke of occupants. There was only one fellow that spoke of occupants and his name slips my mind right now. And I never did read that book anyway until like 40 years later. 
Now you think your mm -hmm. whole family is um, uh, experiencers and may have been, you know, part of this. So can you talk about that? Like you're with your mother, your son, you, what leads you to believe that, that the, this is sort of a family thing with you? Well, all this stuff doesn't really come to mind until years and years and years later, right? At the time when you're told these things or you have these experiences, you don't really know what it is. And it seems to uh, come together years and years later. The first thing I heard, which I didn't relate to UFOs, my mother told me she once had a dream. And when she woke up, she was lying on a, on a stone slab. And she could only move her head. And when she looked around, she noticed there were a whole pile of other stone slabs with people on them. Wow. Well, to me, all my life, that was just a nightmare that my mom had. Yeah. You know, but now as the years progress and more stuff comes out about the UFO enigma, uh, I've come to realize that possibly, you know, my mother was was abducted. You know, wow. I don't know. I'll never know yeah. for sure. Yeah. And another thing that happened to me in this memory, I don't know whether it's a memory, a dream, wishful thinking. I don't even know what it is. But when I was a child, we used to go picnicking a lot in, in, uh, in Liverpool. We used to go into the countryside almost every weekend. And I remember, I don't know how old I was. I was maybe five years old. And we always collected bluebell flowers when we were kids. My mom would get us to do that and they would make necklaces out of all these little flowers and stuff. And uh, I go into this one area that's all full of moss. And I've always had an affinity for moss. I love moss. Uh, with a little tiny stream. And it seems like, I don't know, again, I don't know whether this is in my memory or it's just a dream. I don't know what it is. But it seemed like a deer put its nose right on my nose. Wow. And I could only see, let me see, I could only see the left side of its face. Oh, no, the right side of its face. So my face was right next to its eye. And the strange thing is, is that this deer was like a Bambi. It was like a cartoon Bambi. <laughs> so I have no idea if that's real or not, it's, but that's my memory. And then not long ago, about, about 10 to 12 years ago, I'm sitting in the living room with my family and I could sense something coming. And I said to them, I said, can you feel that? Something's coming. And they all looked at me as if I've gone batty. <laughs> and, and I said, yeah, I can. And it was, it was really a strong feeling. And it was daylight. So I managed to talk everyone into going out in the backyard and lining up against the back of the house. And that, that would be Carol, Sheila, Matthew, and my wife, Diana. So we're all standing there. And I can feel this thing getting stronger and stronger. It was almost like I could hear a rumble. Uh, but in my mind's ear, though, I don't think it was audible. So next thing you know, there's a great big shooting star went right across the northern sky, horizontal, yeah. and leaving a great big long tail. Okay? Yeah. And I couldn't believe it. How did I know that was coming? Yeah. So, then, so then we all walked back into the house, and no one said anything. And I didn't say anything and we didn't discuss it. And to my amazement, like this happened 15 years ago, 14 years ago, but yet it was only like last year when it dawned on me, I said to myself, why didn't we say anything when we got back in the house? Why didn't we talk about that? And then I thought, I'm gonna ask Diana and Matthew and Sheila and Carol, if they remember this day, none of them remembered nothing. <laughs> so that's another strange occurrence. Like, you know, you can never, yeah. I can never definitively say what happened there, but it sure sounds a bit like some stories of abduction. <laughs> yeah. So you did, you did the drawing in 69 and then you start doing this kind of this kind of stuff was coming. When did you and your son start doing the, the, the paintings of the drawings of the aliens? About 2005, 2000, about 2005, 2006. Yeah, this, this stuff just fascinating when you sent this stuff. I mean, it's just like amazing stuff. And what, what's the idea behind this? It, it's usually grays. You have some, we'll show some 
uh, mantids, but usually it's greys. Is that what you figure the contact is with? Yeah, I figure it's with the greys. Yeah, I, I do, because that's the most consistent uh, scenario in the UFO literature. Yeah. So, you know, it probably is that. However, I don't, I, I don't think they're aliens, though. Okay, so what do you think they are? I think they're genetically engineered creatures, and they're made by humans, and they were made a billion, two billion years ago, or, I don't know, made in the future and sent to the past. I don't know. I don't know when they were made, but... Okay. And, and what, what's, their, what's their objective? What are they doing? Their, their main objective is to keep the moon in place so life can continue to flourish here on Earth. Oh, yeah, I remember you saying that, yeah. And meanwhile, all kinds of other things on the side. Some things make them look satanic. Some things make them look angelic. Yeah. It's hard really to say, like... How, would, how, would it, how long would it take to do a drawing like this? And is this your son or yours drawing? Okay, well, I do the concept art for the alien faces, but then Matthew just converts that into 3D models. So it takes him days to do to do a model. It may take me, I don't know, an hour or two each day for three days to come up with a drawing, depending on what I'm drawing. Sometimes I can come up with something in a couple hours. Is your son doing this professionally? Is, is that his job now? He's actually doing it professionally now. Wow. I talked him into selling files there not long ago. And he's selling files and he's having he's having a really great success with it yeah we'll get to those we'll show some of the models that he did that you're doing the 3d printing can you explain to people what 3d printing is for people who may not understand what you're actually doing well okay okay uh, let's see if i can explain it uh yeah it's just a machine the 3d you buy this liquid called resin yeah and then that's placed in a machine you take your file from the computer from the computer and and load it into the machine and then you're able to 3d print just about anything wow. and it's all done with it's all done with light and liquid fascinating so you're it's doing you're, you're doing these aliens and you're also you told me today you're going to be doing ufo stuff as well through the 3d printing. yeah matthew and i want to do a few models you know to do with the ufo enigma we haven't got to that yet things take a while but uh, hopefully, we hopefully will get to it. Did you send me this one? Is this yours? No, that's not ours. No, it's not yours. Okay, it looks very much like yours. That's where I was wondering. I just thought maybe it wasn't yours. This one's yours, right? Yeah, that one's Matthew's, yeah. That's incredible. That's just, wow. Yeah. They are just unbelievable. We always put reflectivity, we always put reflectivity in their eyes. Yeah. But from my studies, there is no reflectivity in their eyes. Yeah, that's the fast, most fascinating part. Or with the ball, where you've got the reflection off the ball, where you, you can see. This yeah. one here? Uh, that one is the 22-inch alien that we took from a... That's a drawing I made from a, a newspaper clipping of a blurred of a blurred creature, allegedly 22 inches high. I think it, the picture was taken in Britain. Wow. And that's a different concept of it? Yeah, it's just different lighting I was messing around with. Wow. But yeah, that little creature was amazing. Like, and I was amazed that I could glean all that from this blurred picture. Wow, that's fascinating. Just, do you, do you, do you run into other artists who are doing UFO stuff? Because that's the thing that sort of amazed Nicole and I, is that there seems to be this connection that, whether it's the right brain thing, creative people are having UFO experiences and they're also artists. It, it, you have the same thing with musicians that yeah. um, do you, I, you, you try to put the connection together why you are so much interested in this? Does it have anything to do with the uh, UFOs? I think I'm interested. I've Well, since 1966, when I had that sighting, I've never stopped being interested. Yeah. I'm just fascinated by the whole enigma. And, you know, my idea as to what everything is has changed throughout time, too. Do you do any other art besides alien type stuff? Oh, yeah. Yeah, lots of other art. And this here, explain what this was. I think you had this in your. Okay, this is a this is a freehand drawing that I copied from Ray Fowler's book, The Watchers. Okay. But I included that little mothership at the top. Oh yeah. That wasn't mm -hmm. in his book. And this one here, you have various, almost like various species. 
Yeah, yeah. that one's neat to see. All to me, four. to me, they're different models. Like they're different models. There's probably there's probably a hundred different models of what these things produce. Wow. And I think atmospherics has a lot to do with it, where they're from, their oxygen mixture, stuff yeah. like that. And this one here, where do you get the idea for this one? Because the eyes are a little bit different. Okay, this one is Jonathan Reed's picture. Oh, okay, okay. Oh no, no, this isn't Jonathan Reed's picture. This is a picture taken from an old UFO book. And I was drawing it to see if it looked anything like Jonathan Reed's uh, okay. so-called alien. And it does, it resembles the one he drew. Wow. And I believe like what we're looking at right there is actually just a helmet. Okay. Which can shape shift to looking like plastic, metal, skin, whatever, whatever. And underneath is that creature we saw just beforehand. So in other words, they wear a uniform literally from head to toe. Yeah. Fascinating. Zoe, explain the Zoe thing. You mentioned that to me. What why the name Zoe comes from? Well, I don't know what that's just that's just from meditating. Oh, I and thought you had something about it moving around, it zipping around or something, or it, it, well, it's from meditating, and I never had I, you know, it was like I was meditating and I was it's like I had communication with spirit guides and the spirit guides call me Zoe. And it was so strong. You know, I said to the kids, I said, one day we're going to find out something about Zoe. Well, my last name is Chin. And what we did find out is there are people called the people of Zoe. And okay. most of them are from a Chin tribe <laughs> wow. over in Cambodia and uh, near Cambodia and Vietnam. We did find that out. And then, and then I realized just not long ago that it seems as if the word Zo is a, is a symbol of a controlled UFO crash. The Z is the zigzagging. Yeah, yeah, and, that's what you mentioned. And the O yeah. is the UFO. There you go. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> wow, yeah, I like that. You mentioned no, spirit guides. Is there a connection between spirit guides and um, aliens? Well, that I can't answer. I just, I don't know. I actually don't know. But do you, do you have do you have contact with spirit guides? I did during like between 1999 and about 2003, and I was meditating, always meditating because I hurt my side and I had lots of time on my hand. Yeah. So I started meditating, and then I started seeing my dad, who had died nine years before, and then it seemed as if my father introduced me to these spirit guides. It it seemed that way. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and I don't know whether this is just my my innermost mind or or was it really you know uh spirit guides uh, i'll never know do you, do you think you're guided do you like i often ask experiences do you think you have a mission do you think you have some sort of guided mission that you're supposed to that you're on or doing stuff i don't think of it that way but but yet i yeah i guess i do in a way now this one's a bit different this is like a praying mantis type thing you did a few of these Mm -hmm. I only did a couple of these because I was, you know, some things we see and we just, uh, we have a hard time believing. Well, I've always had a hard time with the idea of praying mantis aliens. <laughs> However, there are so many reports that I thought, why not add this to the, uh, to the list of drawings, you know? Derek, what, what got you into meditation and why did you start following that sort of path? Well, I hurt my side really bad in, in May 1999, and I was sort of bedridden almost for a whole year. I mean, I'm still in agony. I've got a heating pad on right now in my lower right side. So having been a construction guy and always working with wooden things, you know, like, and, and uh, just doing it, I was always doing something. For that one year, I couldn't do anything. So mm -hmm. I decided to start writing, and I, then I decided to start meditating, and then I I happened to start making palindromes, which yeah. I don't, I just did that to pass my time, something to do. Yeah, you're how often, oh, I was going to ask, how often do you think um, things come to you as you meditate? Does that happen, happen often? Like you mentioned, uh, Zoe kind of came to you in a meditation. Well, I don't really meditate anymore. 
I meditated like between 1999 and about 2003, 2004. Mm-hmm. And then I, I kind of stopped. But, but it, it kind of, um, it helped me discipline myself, discipline my mind. And I, I began to believe that's what meditation is for, is to discipline yeah. yourself, because I, I needed that. Uh, but since then, of course, yeah, I think with a different mind, I think. And uh, things do come to me every now and again. Without the aid of meditation, you know, right? It just happens, eh? Like the Zoe thing, I never ever thought that that was a, that could be a symbol of a of a controlled UFO crash. And all of a sudden, one day, just about what nine months ago, that came that just popped in my head. Hmm. What is pan? What's this about? Well, pan to me, like uh, the word panic comes from the word pan. Okay, because it's a Greek word. And uh, people used to run in panic when they heard Pan's flutes. Oh, yeah, yeah. And thus we have the word panic. So I just think of it as, as that one fellow, uh, that French fellow, Valet. Yeah. He thinks uh, that uh, all the stories of elves and fairies are actually stories of greys. So I think, you know, Pan was probably the Greek version of the same thing. We're going to get to your video, which, um, well, here's your son's uh, stuff you're doing right now. Go through this. This is oh. the 3D stuff that you're doing. Yeah, These this is so a, intricate. Yeah. This is a bobcat skull. It's uh, what you call filigrade, and uh, it's beautiful. Uh, we make uh, palm sized ones, and ones quite, you know, could fit in both your hands, large ones. I think this is a large one. And uh, it's an it's a anatomically correct bobcat skull. How many hours of work do those take? Those are just so detailed and well, intricate. For him to print it out, it would take about 14 hours to do mm-hmm. the top part of the skull and then maybe another six hours to do the jaw. I mean, to, cre- to create it, to actually create it as a model, mm-hmm. to prepare it for printing, that would take a few days. Wow. That would take a few days. And that's a anatomically correct raven skull. And that took him a few days to make the model. And then of course, <laughs> so you know, cool. another 20 hours to print it. And then he brings them to me and I glue the parts together, right? I glue the top beak to the skull and then there's the bottom jaw, I glue that together. And then I mm-hmm. paint them all. I like how the, the spiral uh, is incorporated is did you guys realize that's sort of the Fibonacci sequence spiral? Oh, I'm, I'm sure Matthew knows that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to me, I just look at them and I think, um, I think like we're part Asian, we're part British, we're part African. So I believe when people do art, their ethnicity comes out in their art. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, there are a lot of white people in Canada that will do art. And when you, I look at the art, I can just not by looking at them, by looking at their art, I can say to them, hey, you're part Native American. <laughs> <laughs> so, so with this art, it kind of looks, it, to me, it looks Asian, it looks Celtic, you know, and maybe a little, maybe even a little African. What? And a little Mongolian. Yeah. This is a human skull? This is a human skull, also anatomically correct. Wow. And also with these, we make palm sized ones and then ones much larger. Okay, well, we've got to make sure we get your details so we can link that up for people because I'm sure lots of people would like to have this in a collection. What's this here? Uh, these are the wings for the, uh, at the moment, Matthew is working on uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. Uh, we had an old version from 14 years ago that I, I kind of tried to get him to print out, but Matthew is a, uh, He's a perfectionist and he wants to uh, make the, uh, he wants to redo the ark. So he wanted to redo the wings and redo the angels. And it's going to be unbelievable when he finally comes out. Wow. And then th- this is a raven now. On that angle, the raven looks a bit like an alien. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah, it does. <laughs> wow, it does. And it's anatomically correct. And you should see what's on the underside. I'll take a picture of what's on the underside. You're not going to believe it. On the underside of the of the raven, it looks like an alien sitting down on a throne <laughs> with his knees up. With his knees up. 
I'll send you a picture <laughs> later. I've never taken a picture of that yet. Wow. I only noticed it the other day. Wow. That's, That's a bobcat cool. skull. My daughter also has done a few uh, paintings of aliens. Oh, is that right? But not many, just a couple. And that's a flute that he created. That's a, that's a fully functional shakuhachi Japanese flute. Wow. Wow. The creativity definitely didn't skip generations in your family. <laughs> no, I always encourage my kids to do artwork. And it's like, it's been unbelievable to watch. Like they're doing all the things I would have loved to do. And it's kind of mm -hmm. made full circle. And I'm so happy with it. Now there's the Ark of the Covenant. That's the old one. Matthew's going to do this again. He's doing this again right now as we speak. Wow. And it's going to be so beautiful and so amazing. I'm really personally excited about the Ark of the Covenant. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a section of the flute. Okay, now let me skip this and let's go to the video. I want to show this video. This just blows me away here. Oh, I love the video, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is, we'll talk about it as soon as I show it, if I can get it to come up here. We have more clips, and one day I'll get them to you. They're buried in old computer hard drives. Yeah, this is incredible. This is like, you know, everything Matthew and I ever studied about greys. This is kind of like what we think they're like. And, you know, maybe they wouldn't walk, though. Maybe they wouldn't walk, though. They would hover. Yeah. We had a friend do the music back in Manitoba, Noah Wadewolf. And then we've got Jonathan Reed's gauntlet on the wrist. And their abilities and their technology is, you know, from our point of view, it's just all magical, but really it's all technological, I believe. And here he yeah. is calling, calling the UFO, just like, reminds me of the Lone Ranger here, calling his horse. <laughs> the Lone Ranger always used to whistle and call his horse. And then this next part where he turns into a, uh, he turns into an orb. Yeah, to go in, yeah, that's pretty cool. And that's what, uh, uh, we all know Daryl Sims. Yeah. He, uh, he told me that a hard-edged orb is a gray in transit. And a fuzzy-edged orb is, is a, a monitor orb. Wow. So we use that concept to, to show it. And, you know, there's lots of orbs been seen, as we both know, Grant. That's how I met you the first time. My first uh, great UFO experience was going with you to uh, see if we could gather um, uh, footage of Charlie, what you call Charlie, Charlie Red Star, in yeah. Burling, Manitoba. Uh, we were unsuccessful that night. However, you had been there dozens of times, and I have certainly been there dozens of times. Yeah. And almost every time I saw orbs. And one time I chased one of those orbs for 28 kilometers. Yeah, I used to do that too, yeah. <laughs> almost down to the border. And when, when, it, when it went over the highway, it made a 90 degree turn up, 90 degree turn across the road, 90 degree turn down, back to the same level it was on this side and continued on. That part was unbelievable. I couldn't believe that. And it did that in a split second. How long would this video have taken to make? Oh God, this took Matthew probably a month. Wow. But you know, I don't remember though. I don't remember that, but I would say it took us quite a while because, you know, we talked about it a lot. There were things I wanted in it. There were things he wanted in it. We argued a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> All those things, you know. And then, but finally, we were able to put this together. I have, as I said before, 
got lots of other clips, but I got to find them. And when I do, they're only clips. When I do, I'll send them to you. Just yeah. lately, we got Prime. We got Prime TV, eh? And uh, uh, on one of those things you can get on Prime, there's a whole pile of UFO documentaries, Gravitas, Gravitas UFO documentaries. Well, I can't believe how many UFO documentaries that Matthew's stuff is in. I didn't know that. No, did Matthew. Yeah. We only just found out because we gave it all kind of for free. Yeah. Because we mm -hmm. wanted the UFO community to have better pictures. That was our idea. Eh? Let's see. I'm going to get the other. I got to get the other one here. Where's the other one? Come well, there's on. many, many experiencers that kind of become obsessed with being able to render you know, they're sighting. So I know quite a few people that can do the CGI kind of get sought out by experiencers because they want that visual to kind of go along with their story. Yeah, that's that's basically how we think of it too. We also thought of it like, um, what was I gonna say? Um, oh yeah, we also thought that it might trigger people to remember. Yeah, the and triggering it, effect does happen. And it was our it was our like uh, little private way of profiling the gray. <laughs> like we would... some... Well, like Whitney Strieber's book cover triggered so many experiencers just by seeing the cover. <laughs> and I'm I sure think... that's where I'm sure that's where I got the idea. Well, that's the power of art too. So. That's kind of our running theme. Yeah. It's always been an interesting subject to me. It's uh, fascinating, actually. And this is yours or is this Matthew's? You, you do the, the, the sort of the outline or the... No, I do the drawings of those faces. All, of, all the drawings I've sent you is the concept art. Okay. And mm -hmm. my little sketches that I didn't save, you know, because they're just quick yeah. sketches. And then Matthew, you know, most of the time does the body or picks the color of the suit or, you know. Uh, I got to take all these pictures though. He made the models and then he showed me how to manipulate the models and put them in different positions with different yeah. lighting. Oh, and wow. Click, and, take, and then click and take a picture. So I took most of the pictures, but Matthew is actually the genius in this, not me. <laughs> it's just incredible, incredible talent. It's unbelievable. It is, it's incredible talent. It's so much better now though. And he's so much better now. You've got to remember, this is like 14 years ago. Yeah, he started very young, as you said, yeah. Yeah, he started very young, yeah. That's what no. makes it more so impressive to Self -taught. me. Self-taught, too. Yeah, at first he used 3D Max. Now he uses ZBrush. I just got him a new ZBrush for Christmas. He's just thrilled. And wow. he said he can do things in half the time now. So I don't even know what a ZBrush is. <laughs> ZBrush is just a CGI computer program with which you can, you know, make models, render right. them into photographs, or three D print them. This this looks like Kelowna. You live in BC, right? In the in the I'm mountain living, area. I'm living in Kamloops. Yeah. And you're right. This is um, this is north of Kamloops. Yeah, this looks like Kamloops. Yeah, this is north of Kamloops, about fifty miles up north. I just happened to have some pictures of the countryside and Matthew decided to use those photos to uh he had, he made a UFO land on our street. Yeah, he made a UFO land on our street. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And they even get out and check their instruments and then run back in. And I'll find that clip one day and I'll send it oh, to you. Yeah, we'd love that. This is just fascinating. It's just we got a clip of them coming out of the river. Yeah, and another one of them going into a mountainside with part of the mountainside opening up and then the UF, one UFO flies in and two fly out or something. But I got to find them, eh? Yeah. They're just buried. They've got a bunch of hard drives kicking around. And are there any other, are there any experience or stories that, st that stand out to you guys as, you know, as you hear people talk that you want to kind of recreate what they've discussed? There's quite a few artists that kind of operate that way that I've just started to speak with. Well, we have our own ideas, but yeah, there are things that stand out to me. 
not so much mm -hmm. with Matthew, but to me, like, of course, the Betty Barney Hill story, Travis Walton, Bob Lazar, uh, the Jonathan Reed story, uh, things of what John Leah has to say. Uh, those are the things that stand out most to me. And of course, and you, Whitley, Whitley you got the idea of the grace from Bud Hopkins. Can you tell that story? Uh, that's the first with Bud Hopkins. That's the first time I ever saw a picture of a gray. Yeah. Did it trigger you? Did it sort of hit you as meaningful when you saw that? Uh, it was meaningful in many ways. Yeah. It's, uh, it didn't trigger me as to say, say whether or not that yeah. I remembered anything. Yeah. It triggered me in that it just made everything even more real. Well, here's from, yeah, because see, if you know the story of communion, the cover of communion, they got 200,000 letters. That's why I wanted to put your alien on the cover of one of my books is because it's this trigger thing that when people saw the, the communion cover, they suddenly went like, oh, what's this? That looks familiar. And, and people just sort of resonated with it. Here's mm -hmm. UFO magazine. So this was uh, one of your, the drawings? Yeah, this is one of the first renderings Matthew ever did, one of the best ones we ever did. And you ha you actually have this picture in, in that group of pictures I sent you. Yeah. Um, we sent this to the UFO magazine for free. Yeah. And we told them, we said, uh, we want you to have this because we don't think your artwork, your cover artwork <laughs> is very good. And we feel that this is going to make things better. And then that guy on the side, Graham W. Birdsell, he, oh, yeah. he died that year. Wow. Oh. Yeah, he, he was a big name in Britain. Yeah, he was around the big conference there. Yeah. It's wow. sad that he passed away. That, that's why I wanted to use it on the, on the cover of a book, because it's uh, it just stands out. It's just like uh, you, you can't sort of look away. Well, Matthew and I don't care what you use. You can use whatever you want. Well, we will... <laughs> We'll make sure you get credit and we'll link you up with this. I'm sure a lot of the people that are watching this show, and it'll be thousands of people will be, you'll probably get some contacts from this. So this is a drawing. This is a, a off a photo you're adding to a photo. Uh, this is a photo that Matthew added a CGI UFO to. Okay. There's a few of them I sent you too. Uh, this is taken from a book about fairies. I free someone else actually drew this picture, but I free I freehanded it. You're allowed to do that. Yeah. And uh, I just thought, you know, it looks kind of alien, so I drew it and added it to my collection. And it was in a book. It was in a book about fairies. Really good book about fairies. That when you read it, it seems to be all about grace. Yeah. And this you you come from that uh, from England and Wales and. Ireland, where that was sort of big stuff, the, the idea of fairies and... Well, even as recently as about, about 1963 or 1964, uh, there's a newspaper called The Daily Mirror. And The Daily Mirror would come out, I think, every day, I think it was. And uh, I remember one time uh, there was a story, and the story went like this. It said, there have been three green orbs sighted over the English Channel or the Irish Sea. And they were coming from Ireland and coming to England. Okay? Yeah. And they said they were leprechauns or fairies in the newspaper. Wow. And the next day, I swear to God, every kid, every other kid all across England went out to the parks and the countryside with their butterfly nets. <laughs> and even I did <laughs> with my friends looking for elves. We, we did a whole series on triangles. This is kind of interesting. Where, where do you get this idea from the Belgium triangle? Uh, this is the Rendlesham. Oh, Rendlesham, okay. Yeah, we got the idea from there. The lighting is probably, it didn't have an orange light on top. Yeah. I think it had another color. But yeah, we got that, we got that idea from the Rendlesham. Uh, we were trying to depict a little bit about the Rendlesham incident. And this is it on the ground, the Rendlesham on the ground? Yeah. It's Has, has Penniston ever seen this? I beg your pardon? Has Jim Penniston ever seen this in Burroughs? Oh, I don't know. Oh, well, Nicole knows uh, Penniston. We'll make sure that he gets to see this because he'd probably be interested. Uh, oh, yeah, there's, there's quite a few of this UFO that I've sent you. There's, there's even a clip of this, and I've got to find it for you. 
Yeah, Jim has his own model that he's had made. And I know on his site, they do have some CGI renderings. And I think someone from his team has been teaching himself and working, you know, the CGI concept to try to get close to what he actually witnessed. So yeah, these are very interesting. Yeah, he would like to see these, I'm sure. We'll, we'll send him all these. And that's just out back in our backyard at the last oh. place we lived at. <laughs> wow, that's a beautiful backyard, my goodness. Well, it's over the fence, it's over the fence. Like. Yeah, but still, you got a lake there, you got the mountains, like. Yeah, and there's a, there's a clip of this of him moving around down there. And again, I'm gonna to have to find it one day and get it to you. There's lots of clips that, like I said, I've seen on UFO documentaries and lots of photos, yeah. but there's a whole pile, there's a whole pile that we never ever gave to anyone. Wow. How, how many, how many uh, drawings and stuff would you have? Thousands probably, right? No, not thousands, no. not thousands. Maybe about, to do with UFOs, I pretty well gave you all I have. Okay. So we've got the collection then. Wow. You've got the whole collection. I mean, I've been drawing little pictures all my life. I haven't been able, you know, a lot of it's just got lost in moving and whatever, you know, like, okay, here's a nice pitch. We have a clip of this somewhere of that UFO moving around in the forest. Wow. <laughs> That's incredible. And turning to get through the trees. Like it looks pretty good. It looks so cool. Oh my goodness. That's, that's incredible. And I will find that one day and I'll send it to you, you know, uh, that picture there is of a dream I had and I just tried to draw it and I got Matthew to make it. Wow. And it's like one, two, three, four, five, six pyramid shapes all made into a building. Wow. <laughs> and it was supposedly, you know, in my mind, it was the temple of youth. And when you, when you go in there and sit under that yellow crystal, the sun comes through the top into the yellow crystal and gives people heals people and gives them longer life. That's just in my, my, my imagination. Wow. And it's called the toy, the temple of youth. <laughs> and there's a, oh, I'll go back to that. Hang on. Oh, there's the one going through the trees there. Yeah. I love yeah. that clip because it looks. Yeah, that would be a fa fascinating clip. Yeah. I think we have a clip of this too. Of the UFO flying around. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we do. I've, I've got to find all these things for you. Wow. I'll make sure you get. I'll make sure you get them before anyone else, Grant. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. I mean, it's. Uh, I've always been fascinated. I've known for years that you guys are doing this. It's like. Okay, now that there on the bottom, that's a palindrome. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You were big into that. You're still big into that. Oh yeah, I make thousands of palindromes just in my pastime. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. And then that there is a is a cloning uh, device. Okay. Uh, to create more more grays. Oh, here's another thing I might add. Uh, I believe that the whole abduction scenario yeah. is really mostly about um, uh, cloning procedures. Yeah. It's not about studying us so much. I mean, I'm sure they do study us yeah. too, but it's more about cloning procedures. They need our genetics to make more of themselves. Yeah. Yeah. That would make sense. Or if they're populating another planet or whatever they're doing. Yeah. Is this a, like a beam pulling somebody up or is that what this is? Yeah, this is a, yeah, they're all going back up into the ship. Okay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we have a clip of this. And then there's the gray without its helmet on, like without the big eyes. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then it looks more reptilian. And basically, it's just copied from uh, Jonathan Reed's alien. I think Jonathan Reed saw a gray without its hood on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you talk to Jonathan Reed quite a bit, right? Uh, now and again, I talk to him, yeah. Is he still around? Oh, yeah. he's. Uh, I got him on my Facebook. I talked to him a little bit, not very much. Well, this is the one I, I use quite a bit. This is the one, it's like the abduction thing where they're coming into the room and they, they're ripping through the time. That's always looks like me. They're, they're coming in, opening the portal and they're coming in. That's fascinating. 
well, this freaks yeah. us out when we see it on TV because that's our old coffee table and the box underneath the coffee table yeah. is on my desk right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this one I really like. I've, I've used this one lots of times. And I still have the coffee table. It's, yeah, it's, it gives that interdimensional aspect to it where they can just sort of pop in and pop out. It's in a lot of doc documentaries. And the strange thing is I only found this out in the past 10 weeks. Wow. Fascinating. And there's a picture that probably wasn't in the first bunch I gave you. Yeah, yeah, I, you, I probably sent you lots of doubles. Yeah. But I did, I did find more 3D stuff that I'm quite positive I hadn't sent you. So I sent you all them too, and you may have gotten some doubles. Wow. What is this? Is this the the, the globe, or what is this? Like holding they're holding here, or just an orb? Well, in Raymond Fowler's book. He has pictures of these, like, uh, I don't know what they are. They just fit into the ground and they've got a top. They look like something like Tesla would make. Yeah. And at the top, there's like petals. And we just imagined that or orbs went on them. Oh, no. Raymond Fowler actually says there were orbs on them. Okay. Uh, Raymond Fowler says uh, they came out of the ship, uh, the witness that tells him, uh, Betty, I think her name is. They come out of the ship and they set these up around the UFO, and then mm. the and then the, the little the little balls float up and go check out the area. Uh, yeah, monitors. We had those, and that was the old Charlie Red Star, the the little Charlies that were around. That's what we had the idea where they were monitoring what was going on. Yeah, and I think they can, just like the gray. I think they can make themselves invisible and move at light yeah. speed and things like that. Yeah. Well, Doctor Shirley. And Thanes have said that some orbs are monitors and collectors. They're all various forms of data collectors is kind of how she put it. I think also that's a, uh, it's a gray in transit in some cases too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I liked what you said earlier about when they're kind of a sharper edge, that's when they're occupied and when they're fuzzier that's when they're not i, I had never heard that before uh, daryl sims told me that uh-huh is a good one i like this one and because and because it, it sounds like there's a lot of truth to that i think if uh, jonathan reed's story is correct and everything he's telling us is real well then the graves really do travel around in orbs because that's one of the things uh, that uh, Jonathan Reed is able to do with the gauntlet. He's able to manipulate it and he turns into a ball of light. Uh, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but that's the claim. Wow. There's a good one here, yeah. This is, I, the eyes are so spectacular when you put the reflective stuff in there. Yeah, they, I don't think they actually have reflective stuff yeah. in them because they're, they're all about camouflage, but it looks... They look better with the reflection. That yeah, sure does. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to, uh, you know, we got to remember these things are probably only like three feet tall, four yeah. feet tall. It's like, how could you ever see something like that even in the bush? You, you know, like it would be just so camouflaged, especially if there was no reflectivity in their eyes and they're so short, they could so easily hide. They're so slender and skinny. They could be all over the place. What's this impression? It looks like they're coming out of a, a portal or like a moving through something. What's going on here? I think this was just Matthew experimenting with something. Um, I'm not sure. He yeah. Made a bunch of these. I'd never sent these out to anyone. You're the first person to see these. There's a few yeah, of them. That, yeah, I had never seen this one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah these <laughs> they are so realistic. <laughs> oh, they are. They're so realistic. Here again, it's like they're coming through the uh, the uh, transit station. Through the, <laughs> they're, yeah, they're, moving, they're moving or, down the hallway. They're hovering down the hallway really fast. Or it, you know, it echoes that perception manipulation. Yeah. That's that, amazing stuff. That thing before was an implant wand that we made up. Oh yeah, we have a clip of this. Wow. Oh, it's going into the mountain. Yeah. 
Wow. <laughs> that was outside the back of our house too. And we, Matthew would go out there and take video of that and then bring it in the house and add the UFOs in the doorway. Wow. I'd like to have a backyard like that, Nicole. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, it's nice out here in Kamloops. And then here's an abductee being floated in. And those tubes you can see in the background, that's where they keep their uniforms. Oh, yeah. Ah. Because their uniforms are virtually alive. And there's even a TV in there with pictures of the countryside and the ocean and the sky for the uniforms. Wow. Because the mm -hmm. uniforms are actually alive. There's that meat suit concept that I talk about, Grant. <laughs> yeah. Here's out the mask. Yeah, there's one without the mask. And they do, and they, without the mask, they kind of look reptilian. Yeah. So I think the stories of reptilians, I think that's where they come from. People, because there is pictures, there are drawings of, of so-called aliens in old, old books. I've never found the old book that I saw it in. But uh, in this old book, it looks like Jonathan Reed's alien. Like, and not like these greys. I, I really believe the gray, that's a hood that they're wearing. It's, yeah. not, it's not what the creature looks like. Wow. I'll we'll show a couple more and then we'll wrap up here. Okay. And, and we can go to what's in the future. We'll sort of detail I really appreciate your sharing because yours is one of the best, I think one of the best collections there is of UFO type art. And you've been doing it for so long that. Um, and here's a picture of a gray uh, preparing a suit to be put away for the night. <laughs> that's a uniform, not a gray. That's an idiot. <laughs> so they're like bio suits. Yeah, yeah. Like bio suits. And there's the suit hanging up. Let's go back there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there's the suit hanging up in its chamber when it's not when it's not in use. <laughs> wow, is that ever fascinating? The eye. If you look really carefully at some of these pictures, you yeah. can if you, if you look in through the eye, mm -hmm. you can see the gray inside. You can see the reptilian gray inside in some of the pictures, not all of them, but in a few of them. Yeah, in this one you can kind of see an eye through the lens. Yeah. The detail's just amazing. Each one is detailed a little differently. I was noticing that whether, you know, they patches on their skin or through the neck. Yeah, it's because we did so many drawings and he did so many tweaks, like mm -hmm. we take some Love pictures, us. then he tweak it more, then we take more pictures, then he tweak it again. And I, think I like it. these ones where they're manipulating, you know, like controls, like with those wires. You hear in some accounts, you know, beings maybe off to the side doing things that they don't necessarily know what they're doing or controlling. Right. R reminiscent of that to me. <laughs> yeah, like that picture right there. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. And then I was always fascinated by the description of the uniforms they were wearing by contactees and witnesses and how they have a sheen to them. And yeah, <laughs> always tried to be picked out as people like a lot of our depictions are also uh, from they're from illustrations in ufo books and descriptions that uh, that witnesses have described in a ufo book so we'll take that and try and make a picture out of it and then some of course we just make up fascinating hmm. beautiful thank you derek i really appreciate that and um We'll feed you all the comments we get, and you can watch. Um, it'll be on uh, Nicole's channel, and it'll be on my channel. You probably have seen my channel. Yeah. And uh, you'll see the comments on there, and we'll link up your your all your details because I'm sure a lot of a lot of people collect this kind of art, UFO experience or art. So I'm sure you'll get some calls. Any questions you need? You want to end with Nicole? Uh, no, I'll just say that I'll try and get you those links to Matthew's stuff today. Okay. Later on today. Yeah, over the next couple of days will be fine. Oh, okay. I, I've got a few other things to work on. You don't need to rush and do it today, but okay. yeah, and it'll be nice to see if experiencers reach out to you guys and maybe want their experience rendered. It, it'll be fascinating to keep updated on this. So yes, 
certainly. Thank your son for us as well. I will. And thank yeah. you for having me on, Grant. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, when I come through, um, uh, I think I'm going to be lecturing in BC this year. So maybe I'll stop by and uh, pay you a visit and we'll catch up on the old times. It's, uh, it's, I didn't realize it had been that many years that we've known each other, but um, I really oh, yeah. appreciate your friendship and, and uh, reaching out to me with the UFO thing that um, I guess we were meant to join up and uh, maybe this is part of uh, some sort of mission that we're on and uh, we'll awaken some people and, uh, and uh, share, the, share what we know in, in terms of people who are looking for answers. Well, thank you very much. Beautiful. All thank right, you, everybody. Man. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>